get this in the hands of your marketing team and your sales team. They're the ones making decisions on, day, on a daily basis. That's where the ultimate value is, but it's something that you can't measure. Value captures are kind of the nice big thing because you can put it up there and say, we achieved $10 million savings when we used this software and, and did this project. When you do total profitability management, you're using this data in daily decisions and you're making better decisions. And so you can't quantify with money, you can't quantify the value of making a better decision, right? You just get that value and you don't know what the value would have been had you not had that information and made potentially a worse decision. So I'm going to kind of walk through, you know, that, that's kind of a brief background of, of some of the concept, but I, there's three questions that I'm going to get to that are basically top level down of what questions a company needs to ask to achieve total profitability management. One's going to have to do with value capture events, as I was just kind of talking about, and how they're a reactive approach. Uh, they cover wasteful processes. And then I'm also going to delve a little bit into standard versus activity-based costing. The second one is acting on the data. This is one of the toughest pieces to get to when you, after you implement a tool like ABC. You get the initial action and then you show these great tools and this great information to sales, to marketing, to operations, et cetera. And primarily what happens a lot of times is they receive the data, they say how great it is, but then they don't have an action with it. They don't do something with it to make a better decision. Uh, and then finally, using the data to create a strategic advantage. So targeting opportunities, understanding drivers, tracking reactions, and so on. So on to the three questions here. The first one, how do we create the shift from value capture events to profitability as a constant, pervasive mindset of the entire organization? So again, this is as I, as I said, you know, at LK we implemented our ABC system. We used Acorn. And after implementation, it was right away, let's put a bunch of resources together, go through all the data, and find opportunities. What we realize is the greatest opportunity we can get is by empowering the actual end users of this data. So the salesperson who's face to face with the customer, the marketing person who has to make a pricing decision, giving them that data versus us sitting in a room once every quarter and using it. Second question is how do we ensure that the data provided is acted on rather than just being received? So after our initial success at LK, uh, we realized that a lot of our growth, our uh, you know, continuous profitable growth, it became stagnant. And it became stagnant because we kept doing these you know, quarterly reporting packages, showing top customers, bottom customers, and so on. But people weren't acting on it. The only times they were acting on it was when we had a, a quarterly meeting and, and we made them do something. But in daily decision making, where this data is most valuable, they were just receiving it. They were looking at it saying, OK, great. I kind of know who's my top guy. I kind of know who's my bottom guy. Uh, but they weren't actually creating actions. And then finally, how can we use the data to create a strategic advantage that keeps the competition playing catch up? So when we do value captures, or you know, at US Foods, we call them deep dives. It's the same thing. When we do these types of actions, they're very reactive, right? A value capture and so on, it, it's a reactive approach. Some things already happened that caused you to lose money, and now you're reacting to it so that you stop losing money or that you find a new way to make money. So it's how do you become more proactive? How do you use this great data that you have that you know most of your competition doesn't have to create a strategic advantage? And I'll delve a little further into that as we move on. So diving into the first question, with the value capture events. I'm just going to throw these bullet points on here first. As I said earlier, it's a reactive approach. And it's the result, as I like to say, it's the result of a flawed organizational structure. So just to give you an instance of what I mean there, because sometimes you know, when I brought it up in my own company, I brought it up to my CFO, and he looked at me almost upset as if I was telling him that he didn't organize us correctly. And that's not really what I mean. What I mean is, in an optimal organization, you would catch these value capture items, these $10 million opportunities, $5 million opportunities, you would catch them in real time. So in a value capture where you use ABC data, you, know, you may find this opportunity where you were, just as an example, over-featuring a product, right? 
and you realize that the customer didn't value that feature. So you de-featured it, brought the cost down, and now you said, oh, we've realized this much savings. Let's say it was $3 million annually. Well, in reality, what you've done is you've been losing $3 million annually every single year that that product was over-featured. In a proper organizational structure with this data, you catch that in real time, and you don't have to wait several years. So, it, you know, the next bullet point here, it's a product of a wasteful process. And then again, you also miss strategic advantages. So, in that example, if you had a value capture of $3 million, annualized amount, had you been able to capture that sooner, what could you have used that $3 million to do? Maybe you could have lowered price in different areas to create some sort of strategic growth in a certain segment. Uh, you could have used it for more R&D, multiple areas, uh, but you miss out on strategic advantages by being reactive. And then finally, value captures give the an appearance of savings. And you know, so this is speaking from experience in my own company at, at other companies I've worked at, including US Foods, we have these big initiatives, whether value capture, deep dive, whatever you call it, where we go in and we say, oh, look, we just found $10 million that we just saved. But most of the time, you know, as I was saying earlier, it, it's not that you just found and you just increased your profit $10 million. In reality, you just stopped yourself from losing $10 million incremental dollars. Because a lot of times, these value capture initiatives are just stopping a wasteful process. And then finally, exposing a flaw in the accounting process. So this is when you use accounting processes like standard costing as your management tool or your decision-making tool. And as I'll get into soon, you'll see that there's a big difference between what standard costing gives you and what activity-based costing gives you. And in standard costing, a lot of times it's so generalized and it's not paid attention to with the detail that activity-based costing is. You'll see that a lot of times you find errors in the data or you have bad data on your standard costing side. So I'm just going to kind of go through these quickly, but just talking more about wasteful processes. You really need to have a driver-based data. Uh, you know, ABC is truly the only system I've seen that can give you that level of detail where you can catch wasteful processes in real time. Uh, and you can give that to the end users to use. Uh, value capture against, again, as I said, they equal lost profits. They don't necessarily equal gains. So on to standard or activity-based costing. You know, this is a question that a lot of companies get. And, you know, a lot of times when, you know, software companies present ABC to a company, a lot of times the CFO or an executive says, we already have a, a costing system. We don't need another one. Well, there's a very, very large difference, as we learned the hard way at LK for many years, between standard costing and activity-based costing. Standard costing, you know, basically a lot of times, at least at LK and at other companies I've been at, it's set on a budget, basically. So you project how many units you're going to produce that year, you project your, your overhead costs and everything, and then you kind of just spread it, trickle it down to your products. Well, as soon as you get a month in, the forecast that you had, it's not 100%, so you're not right onto that forecast. The further you get on, the further you move away from what you originally projected in your budget. But that same stuff that you had in the original projection is also what gets into your standard cost. So as you move on, standard cost doesn't necessarily change with your business. Activity-based costing constantly changes with your business. So due to that reason, many the reason I stated earlier, many companies consider ABC unnecessary. And it, it, you know, as we talked about, and we'll probably talk about it at the Q&A, there's a big question of why. It's interesting for me being at different companies now because I've seen uh, one company I've been at has spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on pricing tools, uh, on different IT tools. But when you think about it, spending millions and millions of dollars on a pricing tool without spending anything on an activity-based costing tool, you're only getting half of, half of the value that, that you want to get because how can you price a customer if you don't know the cost to serve that customer, you don't know all the underlying costs of the products they buy. So now I want to talk about acting on the data. So I have a roadmap that I, I'm going to fast forward to here a little bit. These uh, will be good for review. It's a little more of the um, putting words on paper, but I'm going to talk through 
the actual roadmap that I have up here. So this starts from basically the early implementation stage of an ABC implementation. Uh, the, one of the most critical things you can do is the first square that I have up there is user involvement in the data. One of the biggest mistakes we made at LK that we corrected later on was when we involved, you know, marketing, we involved different executives, we involved sales and so on. When we involved them up front, all it was was just asking them questions and we were directing the conversation. What we realized after is we should have been asking them, what do you want out of this tool? What can we provide you? What, do you? what information do you need or would you like to make the best decision? And when we started using that approach, that told us how to build the model because we knew now marketing really wants this information. Sales really wants this information. Operations needs this information. And from then, not only did we know their processes, but we knew where we had to get the model to. So it's really important. The other reason it's important is a lot of times we talk about the organizational behavior of getting an activity-based model accepted at a company. This first step solves a lot of issues with the acceptance rate. And the reason is this. When you sit down and you show this data and you know, people take it certain ways, so let's say I'm showing it to the marketing, chief marketing officer, and he sees it and he, he doesn't like it. He gets defensive because maybe it's showing that his department isn't performing as well as he thought it was. Well, one great thing about having him involved up front is that he was already part of the process. He was part of mapping out his department. He was also part of telling you what he wanted to see out of it. When he's a part of it, then it's much harder for him to question it later on because he understands it and it's much harder for him to make the argument that it was done incorrectly when he was involved. So that's a little bit of an organizational piece that we learned after the first time we implemented, unfortunately, unfortunately but we went back and made sure we did all of that. Next is the data set and that's what you know, you'd use uh, consultants and, and decide your ABC software and then after that, I kind of skip over that like it's the easy part. There's a lot that goes in there, but I, I think everybody's kind of covered it. Next is usability of the data. So to get acceptance from a sales team or a marketing team and so on, you can't just give them a pivot table and expect them to figure it out. We're talking about one of the most complex costing systems there are. Someone like you know, myself or, or one of my colleagues who, who do this on a daily basis understand it and it's not that hard for us anymore to understand it. Someone in sales, I would never expect to understand everything that we put into that model. The models are way too complex for that. So what we need to do is build tools that they can use easily. And so one example of that at LK, we were able to build, our model came out of Acorn, but then using that data, we were able to build kind of add-on tools in Excel and Access that, for instance, our sales team could sit down with the customer and they could have a conversation with that customer about why they're unprofitable. But then in that same meeting, they can log on and they can try changing that customer's mix, maybe to add on a couple higher end products. They can try raising price on certain uh, products and the P&L recalculates for them so they know the impact immediately that it's gonna have to profitability. At the same time, they can also come up with different plans like to uh, incentivize that customer. So for instance, they could say, if I give them an incremental 1% rebate on these higher end products, you know, that will incentivize them to buy more and it'll give them a little break, but it'll also increase the mix of that customer's portfolio and therefore make them more profitable. So next, this middle row can kinda, all three of them can, can move back and forth, but you also wanna constantly be reevaluating usage and adjusting. And so with this, I'll get, a little more into it on one of the next slides, but you want to be doing surveys and focus groups and other things, and you want to solicit honest feedback. So, you know, one difference at LK is if the CFO asked employees, uh, you know, do you like this data? Are you using it? They're going to tell them yes because they don't want to offend him, they don't want to get fired, they don't want to uh, make him upset. However, if you do an anonymous survey, they may tell a very different story, and that story is really whether they're using it or not. Next, you go on to functional tool sets, and I'll combine that with timely reporting packages. So these are, you know, as Sam presented with Snell, those top 10, bottom 10, giving them reporting packages that show their specific performances. So we, 
we had one reporting package for marketing, one for sales, one for operations, and so on. And we could break it down to different departments. And so this combined with the tool sets, then they could use together. So instead of just seeing that they had a bottom 10 customers, so I have another little uh, chart here I'll get to. But basically, these kind of four components are, are breaking it down in its most simplistic form. But you create your profitability model, and that's with ABC. Identify opportunities. You work to build a competitive advantage. And then you want to force your competitors to react. And the reason you want to force them to react, uh, and this is part of the strategic piece, is because at LK, we knew that they didn't have the data that we had. So we knew that if we dropped price, that if they decided to drop price, they didn't know how low they could go to still be profitable. Because we knew at every level, we had the P&L, we had the data, so we knew how far we could go and we felt comfortable going there. We knew that they didn't know. that Typically, if we did that type of, of scenario, that they were just reacting just because it was what we did. So this is a little bit kind of, it's just like an infinite loop that, that we started using uh, there. The first is identify. It says identify and revisit. It's revisiting once you go through it once. But identify your opportunity. And that can be, you know, just as an example, we chose in one segment to lower pricing by 15% because it was a very profitable segment. And our marketing team strongly believed that if we dropped the price by 15%, we'd get enough incremental volume that it would, the P&L impact would be much larger than the discount we gave away. Well, with ABC, we knew exactly what level, exactly what mix we had to keep, exactly the volume we had to hit to, to overcompensate for that price discount. So once we did that, then you, know, you analyze different ways to exploit the opportunity. So is it going, we would run through different models of you know, what if we go to 25%, what if we only go to 5%. Uh, if we went to 25%, it would really create a lot of havoc with our competitors because they would be uh, very confused as to what our strategy was. Um, understand the profitability drivers. This is really key, and this is kind of what I was talking about. When you have this data, you understand everything that can be driving profit. So it's important when you're analyzing these opportunities, look at every lever. You know, there's capacity, and if you're in manufacturing, uh, you know, sales price, discounting, rebates, there's so many items. Understand exactly what's driving your strategic action. The next is to test the decision. And most times we tested it in a small market. We didn't want to just roll out some strategic decision quickly to everyone because we weren't always sure how it would, if it would react the way that we thought it would. So test it. Uh, you can do a small sample size. You can do it in a smaller market. You can you know, try doing it to one customer segment. But you want to do it in a way that makes the competitors react to it because that reaction is really what you want to look for. Uh, because again, you know that they don't have this data. They can't predict the way that you can predict. And then track the reaction and document benefits. So again, sometimes there's unintended benefits that go on to this. So you know, for instance, uh, in the example I gave, when we had come up with the strategy initially, we didn't realize that there were other products that went along with that, accessories and so on, that those customers would also dramatically increase the volume on. So it was an unintended benefit that we hadn't thought through originally that also gave us incremental volume. Well, we want to document that because we want to make sure that that's part of our thought process going forward. Um, you also want to track the reaction because, for instance, if we did that 15% discount and we didn't get incremental volume or it wasn't to the level that we thought it would be, we'd want to know quickly so that we could shut it down and, and rethink our strategy. And then when you get to back to the top, then you either identify a new strategy or you revisit that opportunity. So maybe you started out going 5%, and now you think you can go 10%. And that's just one example. There's many, but uh, you can keep revisiting and tweaking a, a certain strategy. So I already kind of went through some of this, but understanding drivers, you want, really want to apply the data that you have. Again, the next import, or the important piece of that, again, is tracking reactions. Um, one of the biggest reactions that you also want to track that I didn't mention earlier is track the competition. That's one thing that it's sometimes difficult to do, but it's one thing that's very, very important. We want to know how they react to what we're doing. So if we did that 
15% price discount, dark competition follow, or did they not know what to do and maybe they just left prices where they are? Because that would also tell us how long we should keep going with it. And then again, adjust the plan if need be. And some of these I'm just kind of going through because I already talked about them in the uh, circular roadmap. And so then this kind of brings me to my final piece of, uh, of the presentation. Are you going to respond or react? So we, st we started asking ourselves this at LK because we felt like we were constantly in a reactionary environment. We are always reacting to what another competitor did. We were always reacting to data that we had that showed we were losing profit. Uh, we finally we wanted to get to the point where we were responding and that we were becoming the driver. Uh, we were the ones who knew what levers to push in our industry that would create profit and create shared value with our customers. So reacting, again, that's relying on value capture events in the long term. And now I talk about value capture events. They're absolutely necessary. And, and, in the, in the short term after an implementation, right? Because you need to get that return on investment. But in the long term, we need to get away as, a, as an industry and, a, you know, many companies, we need to get away from relying on value capture events as our only source of, of profitability improvement. Uh, reacting also making decisions based on flawed data such as standard costing or other more simplified costing methods. And then reacting to competitor strategic initiatives. So. That's something I mentioned. You want to be that driver. We want our company to be that driver because, again, we have the best data. So responding, create that shift from value capture events to profitability as a pervasive mindset throughout the organization. So we got to a point at LK that we were very proud of where we had our sales team, we had our, market, or our marketing team, and many other functional departments using data on their own. Uh, some of the tool sets we built the other great thing that they did was they took away some of the reliance on the finance department. So in the past, if a salesperson wanted to do a specific pricing program or rebate program, they ultimately had to go through finance to make sure that it was approved, that it was going to meet profitability targets, and so on. With these tools, when we actually empowered them, they were able to do that on their own. And we built the tools so that they could trust the information they had on their own. They didn't need to come through finance every single time. And what that also did was it allowed them to, to respond quicker. So if there was a pricing uh, approval or something that needed to get done, they could respond immediately versus waiting for, uh, for finance to, to get there. Um, again, you want to ensure that the data collected is actually acted on, and then you want to use the data to create strategic advantage. And one more example I'll bring up as far as the strategic advantage of this data and using it in real time. We had the opportunity one time to bid, and it was a one-day bidding, and we either got the deal or we didn't, on about 50 products from a customer. It was from an existing customer, but it was new products for their portfolio. And they told us, one day in the room, we'll come up with the pricing, we'll negotiate, we either sign a deal at the end or we don't. And the first thing that our, our vice president of sales who was going to be leading our end of that meeting, the first thing he did was he asked for our ABC tool to be in the room because he knew that we could plug in that pricing, we could plug in the volume, adjust the capacity, and we knew exactly where we could go, better than, than the uh, customer did. And so we knew that we could take a negative contribution on certain products just to get the volume and make the customer happy because we knew we'd get it back on others. And so it's just another example, you know, that deal alone after we came to a conclusion, that deal made us millions of dollars uh, at the end of the day, and it was a very tough deal, and we never felt so confident in cutting a deal like that in a one-day negotiation. So that brings me to the end of my presentation, and I just want to thank you guys again for uh, being a great audience. Thanks.